in the studio with us today. Dr. Major G. Coleman is a law professor at the North Carolina Central University School of Law. He has a PhD in political science from the University of Chicago and a law degree from the University of Maryland. He has practiced law for many years with the federal government and is an expert on the political economy of race, evidence, the scientific method, formal argument, critical thinking, and logic. Let's welcome to Hope at Night, Major Coleman. Dr. Coleman, thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you. Tell us a little bit about yourself and your background. Uh, I grew up uh, in New York. I flunked out of high school in New York, and then I went back to school. Wow. <laughs> well, now we also have a special guest here with us. Who else do we have here with you? My wife is here with me. Okay, wonderful. Now, where did she just come from? She just came from Brazil. She just flew in from Brazil. Wonderful, wonderful. Now, we've just been hearing the story of Elise and Mark. Now, how in the world did you come into their lives? Tell us about that. My, uh, I was teaching, as just as Mark said, I was teaching a class on African-American religion, and Mark was there in his freshman year at the State University of New York. What amazed me about him was his intensity. We spent a lot of time talking about the cross of Christ and how the atonement process works. And Mark had no end to questions. He, in fact, I got tired of him coming to my <laughs> office. Wow, so he kept asking question after question, wanting yes. to understand and, yes. and investigate this more. Now, what did you present that was so compelling? Well, the first thing we showed them was how the cross of Christ works and how the salvation process works. And then we also told them that the Bible was true. And, the, and that they could know and understand the evidence for the Bible. Now, how did the other students feel about what you were presenting? We presented the, the evidence not only to our classes, we had a university-wide program for the entire 8,000 students on the university campus. Wow. wow, what was the name of the program? We called it the Origin Series. Okay, what did you present? Can you break that down a little bit? Sure, sure. We gave them the evidence that the Bible was true. We also had an evolutionary studies program on campus that was teaching our students that the Bible was myth. And I took it as my personal job to demonstrate that that was not true and to challenge the evolutionary studies program to come forward and meet me in public and sign a document that they would engage in a public debate. We offered them $20,000 if they would come forward, sign the document in front, and I had two cashier's checks, $10,000 each, that we were going to offer them on Saturday morning if they showed up. And I really wanted to give the money away. I'd been trying for 30 years without success. <laughs> Wow, and, and what was the response then from the, the school body with all this that was happening? Well, on Saturday morning when we had our program and I had my two cashier's checks there, we waited for somebody from the Evolutionary Studies program to show up and no one did. No one did. Was Mark there also at that yes, time? Yes, yes. Mark was there every year helping me to set up our back-breaking display. Okay. Now, l let me ask you a question. With, with all this that's being presented, was there any uh, issues with the administration or anything like that? Oh, yes, absolutely. The president of the university, who was a tra trained PhD biologist, took issue with our program and they published in the student newspaper that they wanted our program to be stopped. What happened? Well, we didn't stop. <laughs> I, I wrote a response to that and I said, we believe in academic freedom. If you have the evidence, come forward and demonstrate it. If you want to shut down our program, there's no better way to do that than to come forward, show that this is mythology, show that the facts are wrong, and certainly I'll be so embarrassed, so humiliated, I wouldn't dare to present this again. What better place to do this than academia? You, you presented a challenge. You say, hey, look, prove me wrong. I'm, I'm willing to admit I'm wrong if you can prove it to me. I, I said, come forward with all the science that you've got because I'll be there Saturday morning. Wow. That must have been a remarkable time. Mark, do you remember this experience? Vividly. It, it was, it's, I, I remember it like it was yesterday. It was, it was a challenging time. We were waiting. I was expecting someone to come forward, but no one came forward. Wow, wow. Now, how did Elise come into the picture from your perspective? Well, Elise came in as Mark's girlfriend, and, uh, you know, uh, she was sweet and cute. You know, she didn't say a whole lot. You know, I didn't really know a great deal about her, but if she was Mark's girlfriend, that was good enough for me, and she was involved with, with our programs, too. I was surprised at how intense she was and the questions that she had and that she wanted answers to them. Wow, wow. So let me ask you this. Uh, if a skeptic, an honest skeptic, was coming to you and say, hey, look, I'm on this investigation for truth. Uh, I want to understand reality, true reality. Where do I start? 
What would you say to them in the, that few moments that you have with them? I would say that we really, as human beings, we really only have four tools for knowing and understanding what truth is, okay? Formal argument, science, critical thinking, and strong theory. Um, actually, as human beings, there's another way that we can learn truth, and we call that revelation, and that comes directly from God, but even that has to come through our senses, and we call that science. And you've been presenting this uh, when you were at that school for how many years? Ooh, that's, you're going back a ways. We've, <laughs> we we I was there for, for almost 15 years, and we presented that every year. Wow. Every year on campus. So we had, and we took surveys every year, so we know the impact that we had on students. Okay. Uh, Mark and Elise, your life has been changed by the way God used this man. Where are you guys at in life right now? Well, right now, it's been quite a journey. So I went from going to the State University of New York, uh, studying to be a teacher, got my bachelor's and master's in teaching, and then midway through my grad school, I just felt this, uh, I would say, personally, it was God calling me to the seminary, actually after a phone call that I had with Major. Sometimes he just calls me randomly. He's like, hey, Mark, I have something to tell you. you just So he just said, I just see you at seminary, you know. And I was like, you know, this one time that you mention it, I do too. So I just so that's where we are. We're we're in Michigan and in the seminary. Wow, so now you guys are studying for ministry right now. Wow, that's fantastic. This is what mentorship is all about. Fantastic. Well, it's time to go to a break, but in our next segment, we're going to find out more about something Major Coleman has brought with him. This is sitting right here on stage, a full to scale replica of Noah's Ark. Can the biblical story be true? We'll find out more in our next segment, so don't go away. Welcome back to Hope at Night. In our earlier segment, we met Mark and Elise, who recently made the transition from not really believing in God to having a firm belief in Him. We also met Major Coleman, the professor they encountered, who had a major impact on their lives. In this segment, we're going to take a closer look at a story from the Bible, one that has challenged people of faith for centuries, and see if it could possibly be true. Now, Major, I've been itching to get to this. What in the world is this in my stage? This is the largest scale model of Noah's Ark in the world. Uh, what's the story behind this thing? Well, I needed a way to show students on a secular campus that the biblical story of creation and Noah's flood was true. And I figured that the best way to do that was to actually build the ark so they could see with their eyes how big it was and that it would easily contain every kind of animal in the world. Professor Coleman, uh, say someone has never ever heard of the story of Noah and the flood. Could you, could you break down for us real quickly, what is that story all about? Well, it was after the world had been in existence for 1656 years and God decided that because of their wickedness and their violence that he was going to destroy the world. And he ordered Noah to build an ark. And as you can see, that ark was four, 540 feet long. On its launch platform, it would have stood 100 feet wide and been 80, 100 feet high and been 80 feet wide. And this is its size compared to modern ob objects that you can see today. The, the entire flood lasted for over ye a year and it covered all the land on the entire planet. Wow. You know, prior to me becoming a believer in the Bible, I had learned even in Hinduism about the story of a worldwide flood and how a family was preserved during that worldwide flood. Now, I heard this story exist in many different cultures. How do we know that the biblical story is the most accurate story? Okay, well, the best way to test that, again, is with science and understand exactly how the flood happened. Um, before Noah's flood, there was a subterranean water chamber 60 miles down beneath the Earth's crust, which is 60 miles of granite. That water was under tremendous pressure and increasing temperature until it reached about 1,000 degrees. 
Once the crust cracked, it burst forth with the power of a trillion billion atomic bombs. Dr. Walter Brown is the one who invented hydroplate theory, and he has shown us exactly how the flood happened. What's so amazing is not that all living life was destroyed. What's so amazing is that eight people and the animals inside the ark actually survived, and it would take a boat like this for them to survive. So if I'm hearing this correctly, what you do in your presentations and in your course is you take this replica uh, of a story that's found in the book of Genesis, and, and you present the reasonableness of this story. Yes, we show that it was actually could work, that it, that it did work. The first boat in the world that was actually built larger than Noah's Ark was probably the most famous ship, and that was the Titanic. It was the first boat that was ever built that was larger than Noah's Ark. And that boat sunk. <laughs> yes, and it sunk, but Noah's Ark did not sink. It, it actually survived. And when you can see this, when I say this is the largest authentic model of Noah's Ark, Noah's Ark was not made out of lumber. It was made out of hewn logs and put together with wooden posts. Um, the walls were three feet thick, okay? There's no such thing as a 540-foot long tree today. So you cannot build a full, full size model of Noah's Ark. This is the largest correct to scale model that exists. So uh, I'm sure a lot of skeptics ask you this question and that is this, wait a minute, all the life that exists in our world today, that's all the animals, uh, that's all the, the, the birds, uh, the, the, the land animals, yes. all of that came from Noah's Ark. How in the world did God fit all those animals upon this boat? Well, if you, if you look at an encyclopedia of life forms, there are, eight, there are 90 s of s genus forms of life that exist now. The average size, so 90, 90 different kinds. If you count those 90 different kinds of animals and you take the largest species in every genus, by the time you get to the middle one, number 45, you're down to the size of a rat. There were 15,000 animals on the ark, and the average size, even if you include a brachiosaurus, um, almost 70 feet long, 110,000 pounds, the average size on the animal, of an animal on the size of the ark, was the size of a rat. So um, Noah could have had 15,000 rat-sized animals and cages on the ark. The total volume of the ark was 2.2 2 .2 million cubic feet, um, 15,000 cages, four cubic feet would take up about um, about 25 percent of the space on the ark. So most of it was empty. Wow. Wow. That's incredible. Most of it was empty. And so when when Noah's ark landed in those mountains, uh, what I'm hearing from you is those kinds or those uh, family groups, they went out and they begin to multiply and fill the world. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, so after you have, if you have different kinds of animals or genus of animals, that is, um, they can, you can have different species that come from that. So for instance, wolves, coyotes, dinkos, foxes, they are all dogs. Okay. Right. So you would only need one type of dog on the ark that would be four dogs, two males, two females, that could produce all those different species and the same things with the other animals. Let me ask you this question, which is, why are you so interested in this biblical story as opposed to any other biblical story? Well, there, that is because, first of all, Jesus believed in the flood model and it's the, it's the basis for the entire authenticity of the Bible. If you can prove that the Genesis story is false, you have destroyed the entire belief system that, on which Christianity is based. So that's why we use this model to show people that Noah's Ark was real and that the story is true. Well, couldn't the story have been symbolic metaphor for other kinds of events that took place? How about creation? Couldn't that have been symbolic or, or metaphorical in, in the language that's there? Well, it, it is possible, but when we look at the uh, four postulates of creation and we compare them with the four postulates of evolution, only the postulates of creation have been observed. Evolution is based on four major ideas. None of them have ever been observed. Number one, that life comes from non-life. We have not one single example of life coming from non-life. Number two, that all the life forms that we have today came from single cell life forms. 
many people do not know that while we do have single cell life forms that we call bacteria, we have no two cell life forms, we don't have three cell life forms, we don't have four cell life forms, we don't even have five cell life forms. That is, we go from single cell bacteria to complex life forms. So there's no evidence that all life comes from single cell life forms. The, the, the third postulate of evolution is that time and chance drive evolution forward, of course, and time works against evolution. The chance of one simple 100 unit protein coming together by accident is, this is a very big number. It's time and chance make evolution absolutely impossible. The fourth postulate that evolution is based on is that um, what we see today Minor genetic variation in species is evidence of macroevolution. So because cats are different colors, dogs are different sizes, that means that fish turned into cows. And of course, we know that that's not true because uh, Mendel proved that all the genes that exist today, you can shuffle them around, but there are no new genes that created, were created. Let's, let's think about the four major postulates of creation. Number one, where there's a design, there must be a designer. We see codes in DNA. Codes are evidence of intelligence because you have to translate from one language to another. We have not a single example of that happening by accident. Number two, that the Earth, the solar system, the universe, and the galaxy are young, measured in thousands of years, not millions or billions of years. Many times people ask me, they say, well, Major, you believe in a young Earth, a 6,000-year Earth. Can you show me that that's true without using the Bible? And I say, absolutely. What's the oldest living thing on the planet? The oldest living thing on the planet? Trees. How old are the oldest trees? 4,500 years. That takes us back almost exactly to the year of the flood, okay, in 2,500 B.C. Remarkable. Number two, I'm saying, look at the sky. Uh, uh, we call solar nebulae. A solar nebula is uh, what we see from a supernova when a star explodes. It leaves a gas cloud. Because of our radio telescopes that we have now today, we can look deep into space and we can actually count the number of solar nebulae that are there. And how many are there? A supernova a, 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 takes place about once every 26 years. How many solar nebulae do we have? 6,000 years worth. That's impossible in a universe that is billions and billions of years old. And we have other evidences such as alpha decay that we do in our program that most people don't understand that also shows that the earth is 6,000 years old. So that's the second postulate that proves that the biblical story of creation is true. Life that we see today are the basic kinds of animals and plant life that were originally created. So we can test that. You can breed dogs, you can breed cats, but you can't breed cats with dogs. So there are limits to how far we can go. And lastly, that is, Earth experienced a worldwide flood in approximately 2500 BC, 1656 years after the world was created. The world is filled with limestone. Limestone is sedimentary rock. It precipitates out of water. The entire Earth was filled with water. Every mountain chain in the world, including Everest, has sea life on top of that mountain. The mountains rose out of the water, so we know that there was a worldwide flood. Let me, let me pose a question to you, and Mark and Lise, feel free to jump in in this. And that is this. Most people who don't believe in God aren't card-carrying members of the Atheist Club. They haven't studied molecular biology. Yes. Why don't they believe in God? What is the struggle there? Um, Neil, I'm going to tell you, that's a very good question. My answer to that is probably because most of them has not actually seen the evidence that supports the Bible. And that is my job, to actually show them. You're right, most people are somewhere drifting, somewhere in the middle. This is a war for ideas. And it's my job, it's my job to combat these forces of error particularly in secular campuses and in universities, which is where I work and teach, and show that the evidence supports God's word. God is a God of science. That's fantastic. Mark and Lise, would you like to add to that? I think that even if you're not into all of the science, it's in the media, and it's just like little subtle things here and there. It's just like we grew up watching dinosaur cartoons and just watching Disney Channel, and it's just like, of course the world is billions of years old, and so, like when you get introduced to the biblical stories, you're just like, that's myth. That's just like 
Zeus and Poseidon right. or like, okay, maybe there's some reality to it, but that must be metaphor like you were saying. And why? Because that's just what we grew up on and that's what we were indoctrinated to believe. Uh, okay, let me pose this question to you guys. Uh, say someone grows up going to a Christian church. Uh, say they have been surrounded by, you know, a church community and uh, pastors who preach sermons. Are there wrong ideas of God that exist? Wrong ideas of the Bible that exist? Well, certainly, certainly, certainly they do exist. And they exist in church. Many people don't know that some of the largest religious denominations actually support evolutionary theory. And I'm, I'm really sorry to hear that. Um, it is important that people test any church that they go to against the Bible to make sure that it is, it is accordance with the truths of the Bible. Jesus believed in the flood story. And he said that he was coming again and it would be just as in the days of Noah. So if Jesus believed it, it's very difficult for me to understand how you could call yourself a Christian if you don't understand or accept the story of Noah's flood and the creation story. And of course, it's important to understand the science that goes along with that. We have to do, as educators, I'm an educator, I have to do a better job in making sure that people understand and that they know the science, that it's not just based on faith. God never asks for blind faith. It's always based on evidence. I really appreciate this discussion. I think what I'm hearing he here is that uh, with the evidence that you are presenting, you are providing a space for faith. You are giving people a reason to believe. Yes, And I yes. think that's fantastic. Yes, absolutely. Uh, Major Coleman, you see that camera right there? There are people who are watching right now. There are people who are struggling with their faith in God. If you were to look at that camera right there and you were to talk to someone who was struggling, who was maybe a skeptic, someone wrestling with doubt, what would you say to them? I would say, hold on. The evidence is there. God is interested in you. He respects who you are. If you read, if you study, if you seek him with all your heart, you will find him. He has promised you that. The evidence is there and I am here to help. Wonderful. If, if someone wants to find out more about what you're presenting, where would they go? They could go to powerstation.org. That is my website. You can just send me an email, major at powerstation.org, and you can find me. Powerstation.org. That is right, powerstation.org. That's beautiful. Well, it's time to go to a break, but when we come back, we'll get to hear some questions from our live audience for the guests tonight. So don't go away. Welcome back to Hope at Night. We've heard some mind-boggling facts, and I'm sure you've got questions. I'd like to turn to our live in-studio audience and see what questions they have for our guests. So let's find out. Does anyone here have any questions? Right there. Hi, I was just wondering, is it possible that any other humans or animals could have survived the flood that basically took over the entire Earth? The answer to that is absolutely not. I've been asked that question many times before, and usually it comes because people don't understand how powerful Noah's flood was. The explosion of that subterranean chamber ripped around the planet at 12,000 miles per hour. It was faster than the speed of sound. If you saw it, you would hear no sound. The next thing you'd know, if you saw it, less than a second later you were dead. That's how fast it was, it was, it was moving. It buried everything under 10,000 feet of water. What actually happened was that the continent sank, okay? If it would destroy a Brachiosaurus, all right, the most powerful land animal that ever lived, 52 tons, 110,000 pounds, believe me, there's no human being that could survive that de devastation. Dr. Walter Brown has said the, the power of that explosion was a trillion, billion atomic bombs. Absolutely wow. not. Wow, wow. That is that is intense. Yes. Wow. Let's go to our second question. Do we have anyone else? Right over there. When you're checking the truth of things against the Bible, how can you be sure you have the correct interpretation when there are so many different interpretations and translations going around? Um, 
Most biblical scholars encourage people to use several different translations of the Bible, and I certainly do. Um, just about all of them are good translations, and they can give you different perspectives. You can use some direct translations from the Greek and Hebrew. You can use paraphrased versions if you want to try to gain understanding. And of course, today with the computers, and we have uh, transliterations of the Bible in Greek and Hebrew, you can look for the Greek and Hebrew words and find out exactly what they mean. I like to tell people, if you take the widest, particularly when we're talking about dates in the Bible, which are the most controversial, if you take the widest divergence of all the translations, the Bible is from 6,100 years to 7,300 years. That's how, that's just a little bit over a thousand years difference, no matter which translation you use. Uh, any translation shows that evolution is not true. Um, for me, I take the short age the youngest, 6,100 years. Why? Because that matches the scientific evidence that we have. Solar nebulae, helium decay, and the ages of trees and moon dust. All of those we can measure fairly exactly. We're right almost at the 6,000 year mark. But I recommend that you use different translations to try to whatever will help and increase your meaning for the Bible. Has there been any evidence to substantiate the accuracy of the scriptures we have today? Oh, uh, ab absolutely. We have th many old documents that predate Christ, okay? We don't have any the original books of Moses that Moses wrote with his, with his actual hand. But again, some of the best evidence that I have found is that supporting to s the flood to show that the Bible is true. Okay. Um, we, have, we have found uh, uh, the ostuary that is the bone box of Caiaphas, Jesus' brother, James, okay? So um, we, for many years, um, archeologists refused to believe that Pontius Pilate existed until they found his name carved on a stone that was part of the wall of the temple. So all of the Bible, the evidence, the more evidence that we find, we find that the Bible is true. I heard a quote, someone said that the Bible is an anvil that has worn out many hammers. Yes, it has, it has. Mark, are you studying any of this in seminary? Yes, in seminary, especially specifically with this with this topic in particular, because in the seminary that I go to, at least Andrews University, we have a high view of scripture. So that they make sure that in our program that we're dealing with the Greek and the Hebrew specifically. Um, so what would happen is we would also say that adding on to what Major perfectly put, there are so many references, we have, more, we have thousands upon thousands of manuscripts, specifically Greek manuscripts in particular, that would point to the validation of the authenticity of scripture. Um, and we treat textbooks as if they were a Bible. So um, that is, if something like a textbook where we all seem to learn from uh, can be viewed in that way, surely the scriptures can be seen in that way as well. Fantastic. Do we have a third question anywhere? Right over there. Uh, this is for the professor. As a law professor, do you sometimes find some conflicts between your spirituality and the laws that you have to teach and practice? And if so, how do you handle that? There are many conflicts between the things that I know are true as a Christian and uh, the laws that we have. Some of them are contemporary laws. Some of them are past laws. Probably one of the greatest people that had to deal with that was Martin Luther King, Jr., that is, the laws of, him, of his day in the Jim Crow era were counter to the laws of God. And he made it very clear. When a human law is not supported by the law of God, I have a duty, we have a duty to disobey such laws. Okay? And that's a hard thing to do. It's a hard thing for many people to do. So I teach that to my class. That is, there is a higher law to human law. And what's most important is that we know what those higher laws are. So that's what I teach in my jurisprudence classes. That's amazing. You know, during the Nuremberg trials after World War II, when the Nazis were brought onto the stand for, with criminal charges, they were asked, why did you do this? Why did you uh, slaughter these Jews? And they said, we're just following the laws of their land. But the prosecutors and the court appealed to what they called the higher law. And they said, look, there's a higher law that's above the laws of the land. So that's really remarkable. Yes, I like the way you, you put that. Martin Luther King Jr., he said, everything that the Nazis did was legal according to their law. Hitler broke no law in Germany. 
<laughs> okay, um, so, but that, that is, there are laws, and then there are God's laws, and we must always obey God rather than men. That's right. All right, do we have another question? Right over there. Were there any insects on the ark? And if so, why did Noah choose to bring them on? <laughs> well, <laughs> now I'm gonna, have to, I'm gonna have to be honest. We don't have biblical evidence of that, but at, uh, however, insects are very hardy. And just like the, the giants of the sea, which you can see here down in front of the ark, the giant a Coronosaurus, a Pleosaurus, blue whales, the giants of the sea were not on the ark, and certainly while many of them died, sufficient survived for them to exist today. So we're probably fairly certain that there were insects on the ark, on the animals at that time, and they survived the flood. Seeds survived the flood, okay? Even though they could have bought them on the ark, a seed can survive in salt water for over a year. Yes, and, and be carried in the air. Yeah, that's right, that's right. right. So they survived. Do we have another question? Right over there. So um, if they were transported, how would you say fish, sharks, dolphins, whales, how are they stored on the ark? Um, one of the things we like to do is we, of course, we have the largest animal that ever lived, a blue whale um, in front of the ark there. A blue whale um, is about 300,000 pounds, 100 feet long. And you can easily see that if you had the desire, if you were crazy enough to do it, you could actually fit four full-size blue whales on the ark. Um, there'd be no real reason to take a full-size blue whale on the ark for, for two reasons. Number one, it can survive in the water. And number two, if you wanted to take a blue whale on the ark, why would you take a full-size one? That is, it'll die sooner, even though they live to be 90 years, you would take a small one, okay? And that would save space. You can see here on the top of our ark, we have a full-size Brachiosaurus, and right beneath it, we have a baby Brachiosaurus. A full-size Brachiosaurus is 110,000 pounds, all right, 50 tons. Um, if you wanted to take one, and you wanted to care for it, certainly it would fit, uh, four of them would easily fit on the ark. And it would only take up three tenths of one percent of the volume of the ark, a full size brachiosaurus. But again, it will die sooner. It has lots of waste. Why take a full size one when you can take a baby? You can see how small it's about the size of a large cow, a small brachios a baby brachiosaurus. So, um, so you wouldn't need to take the giants of the sea, the giant Coronosaurus. Um, which is probably what was described in Job as the Leviathan. You wouldn't have to take a, a Brachiosaurus, which again, described in Job, probably the behemoth with a tail like a cedar. You wouldn't have to take the giants of the sea on the ark and the giants of the land you could take as babies if you just wanted to conserve space. And all of the animals, all of their food, all of their water fit on the first deck of the ark. The other two decks were empty. Uh, Major Coleman, but where are dinosaurs mentioned in the Bible? Well, I just, I just mentioned that in Job, that is we have behemoth. It says that he had a tail like a cedar. He said he has bones like bronze and legs like iron. And I'm saying that certainly looks pretty close to a Brachiosaurus to me. The Leviathan in Job, it says, can you put a hook in its nose? Can you capture it with a harpoon? It says its scales are like iron. And you can see the size. If you look at a Coronosaurus down there low on the ark, you can see its size compared to a human being. It could swallow you, right, in one gulp, all right? Probably wouldn't even have to chew. So they were, a certain, and, and the equivalent size of a, of a Brachiosaurus. So they, there, are, there are not only dinosaurs mentioned in the Bible, but we have post-biblical descriptions of dinosaurs, all right? And we even have, we even have not petrified dinosaur bones, we have mummified dinosaurs that we have found. That is where it's still skin. So they absolutely had to be, the giants of the land had to be on the ark. Um, uh, that's different from saying that all of the different genus of dinosaurs were on the ark. That doesn't mean that but certainly some of them were, because we have evidences after the flood that they survived. Um, the lack of vegetation probably is why they went extinct after the flood. Wow, wow, that's remarkable. It helps you recognize that the story of Noah is very much a reasonable story yes, yes. based upon all the evidence that's being found. I think we got time for one more question, right there. Yes, I was just wondering, um, how did the animals that were on the ark, 
what made them not be able to eat Noah and his family? Like, how did that um, that's the, it, it, it says after the after the flood that Noah and his family. Now, you have to get all these animals out of the ark. And of course, um, they were very powerful and very fierce. And Noah was afraid of them. That's why God put the fear of man in all of the animals. So there was danger of that. And of course, we have an example of a full size cage that would have been on the that would have been on the ark. Probably after the flood, the animals were so anxious to get off of that that they didn't have time for Noah. They, had, they wanted to eat something more than the grain that they had been fed for over a year on the ark. So I'm sure that they had better things to do. The good thing is, is that Noah and his family did survive. And you can see here how small the eight people that we have next to the white van, how small a human being would be compared to the ark. So they did survive. And of course, they were on the third deck we have 20th century evidence, his family, they had housing on the third deck. You could easily keep all the animals on the, on the first deck. And this is an automatic cage. It's automatic watering, automatic um, waste control. They didn't have to do much maintenance, so they could let them go by themselves. Wow, wow. This has been fascinating. Thank you so much, Mark, Elise, and Major, for being with us today and for sharing with us such insightful things. You know, we've been examining the topic of truth and take a closer look at the story of Noah's Ark. Some people look at the story of Noah's Ark as a story of destruction, but it's a story of grace and salvation. Anyone can be saved if they want to be. I'm sure this episode has given you lots to think about on the topic of what is truth and whether or not we can truly trust the Bible as a source of truth. So what do you think? Please follow us at Facebook on Facebook at Hope at Night and send in your comments and questions to us there. And be sure to join us next week for another episode of Hope at Night. <laughs>